Uh, my name is Steve Marr with Risk Management Professionals, and uh, we're going to get started with our webinar. Uh, what I'd uh, basically, this is a continuation of our HAZOP facilitation uh, seminar series, and um, this, this is something we're doing in modules. This is module number four. Uh, as you know, Risk Management Professionals is an engineering consulting firm with a ba background having been involved with PSM. NRMP issues even before they were promulgated in, uh, we've been doing it since the mid 80s. Um, we do a lot of work for uh, a variety of facilities, uh, offshore facilities, uh, platforms, processing facilities, onshore exploration production facilities, refrigeration facilities, very wide range of facilities that have to meet these requirements. Well, one of the cornerstones of meeting these requirements is understanding the hazards that exist at a plant site. For that, there's a variety of tools that we've been examining in previous modules, things like what-if checklist studies. At the very high end of the spectrum, there are things like fault tree analysis and event tree analysis. Well, the, the workhorse of the business for dealing with PSM, RMP, SEMS, and SEMP issues is hazard, hazard and operability studies. So that's been the main focus of our seminar, this seminar series, and our main objective is to help you get enough background so that you can facilitate and do good quality HAZOP studies, which again are the cornerstone of meeting these regulatory requirements, understanding the hazards at your plant site, and of course the ultimate objective, which is uh, protecting the health and safety of the individuals at your plant, protecting the environment, and also the community around you. Uh, so that's what we're, what we're doing here. Before we go any further, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about logistics. As for our previous modules, this is a uh, we're using WebEx as our uh, webinar broadcasting mechanism. It provides two-way communications, which during the course of the presentation you will be muted, so that any activities that you have going on on your end are are not broadcast to the, to the rest of everybody tuning in. Oh, by the way, you rec you're recording this, right? Excellent, excellent. Um, uh, we're recording it too, so people can come back to later uh, and catch up if they if they miss various modules. Uh, so this is uh, this is something that uh, as as we progress, we're going to be doing a presentation that focuses this morning on a variety of issues associated with defining good causes and also safeguards associated. Good morning, uh, and also safeguards associated with the HAZOP study. Um, that's what's going to be our main focus today. We're going to follow that with a little workshop to kind of uh, reinforce those types of activities. And then we're going to go ahead and close with the opportunity for, uh, for questions and answers. Uh, the questions can be posed to our producer, Nicolo Tromba, either during the course of the presentation, if you feel there's an important topic that needs to be brought up, or after the presentation and workshop are done, it'll be an opportunity for, uh, for you to ask questions and, and bring up additional points. Uh, at, the, at the conclusion, uh, if, if there are no further questions, we'll be providing you with the answers to the workshop. So again, we'll progress uh, with starting with the presentation. At any time, if you need technical assistance, either uh, let our producer, Nicola Tromba, know that, or go ahead and call our main office, 877-532-0806, or our, our local number, 949-282-0123. All right, so where, where are we? Uh, basically, the uh, key topics that we've already covered in Module 1, was the regulatory requirements, overviewing it, doing a little case study. Module two was the HAZAP study mechanics, quality tips, consequence analyses. Uh, our last module uh, that we shared with Judith Sakairos was uh, PHA preparation and also what to do with good quality PNIDs. Um, key topics for this item, or for this module, are going to be uh, the details of how to construct a good quality HAZAP study scenario and also some workshop to reinforce key points on defining causes and uh, in safeguards. And so this is a part of this is part of the package that was sent to you last night, by the way. And this tells you what what modules are coming up so that you can schedule accordingly. Okay. So without further ado, I'd like to switch over to our presentation this morning. Okay. We're on module four A. In fact, I'm going to ask you if you don't mind, just reach over. When I flick, when I flick that, if you reach over and just hit the space bar or the page down key, that'll be good. Okay, so what I'd like to do is talk about scenario details. 
Um, real good. Are, are you having trouble? Okay, it's a it's a custom show. Okay, so you do slideshow, custom shows, and 4A show. Okay. All right. Um, okay, that's good. Um, okay, so all right, is it showing right now? All right, that's as good as it gets. That's fine. All right, so I'd like to talk about the HAZUP study scenario details. And um, uh, the, the, just to let you know where we're at, the topics in previous modules that we covered were uh, a history, history and background and regulatory basis and uh, how HAZUP studies came about, what their requirements were, required PHA characteristics and available tools, choosing the optimal, optimal PHA approach for the project, details in the HAZUP study, maximizing the usefulness in the HAZUP study, quality tips, consequence analysis basics, preparing for PHA, and also quality PNIDs. Uh, for this current module, uh, key topics, okay, good. Key topics, good. Okay, key topics for today are going to be correlating the HAZOP st uh, st study scenario contents with PHA objectives, key implementation steps, uh, defining causes, I'll tell you what, this is going to be, I, I'm going to have to take 30 seconds to retool here, guys. Excuse me. All right, what we're going to do is um, I'm going to pull this. And thank you for your patience. Um, okay, key implementation steps uh, is what we're going to talk about today. How to define key causes with respect to human error, control system malfunctions, um, mechanical failures, uh, co common mode failures we're going to talk about, special topics and tips, unusual operating modes. Do me a favor. Um, we're going to take another 30 seconds here, guys. Sorry.
long has the microphone been off? Uh, I guess about 20 seconds. Oh, okay, that's not too bad. <laughs> All right, we've we've had a variety of technical malfunctions today. Are we full? Are we we're fully good? Okay. Um, all right, so um, for those of you who could read lips, you were really tuned into what we are talking about. Um, the, the key thing is defining causes that really help the team out and, and really uncover potential hazard and operability studies, uh, common mode failures, uh, things that can, can uh, be a single mode failure that can have multiple impacts, um, unusual operating modes. Uh, these are things uh, if, you're, if you have abnormal operations or, or different modes of operation, if you don't handle them right, it can really eat up a lot of the team's time. So being able to focus the team, handle the different operating modes properly, that's really key to the success. And not only can you save a lot of time, but you can really improve quality. Uh, defining safeguards, also quality control. Again, the most important thing is to get a good quality has up and keep the team focused. As a facilitator, you want the team focused, you want to keep the team moving, uh, to make sure that you can uncover what you have to uncover and then um, uh, but not let them drift off, get distracted, or basically lose their attention, or even if they leave the meeting. Those, these are really bad if it drags on too, more, too much. So you've really got to keep things focused. And of course, we're going to do a little workshop. Okay, first of all, I'd like to put things in perspective in terms of overviewing the HAZAP study and what the key objectives are. Again, let's look at the big picture. There's a variety of things that can go wrong at your plant site. Some are going to be high consequence, low probability, and of course not very important because even if it's catastrophic, it may be nearly incredible. Other things can be uh, high, high probability or very frequently occurring, but very low consequence. Things like operational upsets may also not be all that important to look at. So what you're using the HAZOP study for is to look at the likelihood of the event, the consequences of the event, as a measure of importance. Things that are higher on the risk curve, as you look at the, the line that's going through the center of your screen on the graph, risk is increasing. So you're really looking for those things that have enough consequences and enough likelihood to make them important. Once you focus on the important issues that you can then identify, are there design fixes, are there things that need to be done to make improvements? So it's all about understanding the probability, understanding the level of consequences. That's what risk is focusing on the high risk events, and then focusing on your design efforts, your operations attention, to making those risks as low as reasonably acceptable. Uh, a quick example, here's a high pressure vessel on level control, um, a pretty typical setup for a facility. This is a representation of how it functions. This is basically a snapshot of a PNID. The whole idea of a HAZAP study is to translate that design representation into what can go wrong with the system so that you can uncover weaknesses and address those high risk scenarios. Uh, the main approach uses a deviation matrix. The idea is to combine guide words and process parameters and look at, at deviations from normal operation, things like decreases in flow, increases in flow, increases in temperature, decreases in temperature, things that may lead you down a path to a path of having a hazard at the plant site. Uh, this a very cyclical approach. You've got a, a very regimented a definition of nodes, pro, apply, application of process deviations, causes that are credible that you want to look at the team to look at, consequences associated with those causes. Again, ultimate consequences that take you down a path of how bad can it get. Uh, then, with that scenario understanding of the scenario, identifying the safeguards that function as a buffer between those causal events and the ultimate consequences associated with that scenario. You use the same approach, cycle through it very methodically, and then what you do is use that to identify potential system weaknesses. Uh, it's represented typically in a tabular form where the team's uh, records are kept with causes, consequences, and safeguards documented. A risk ranking approach is used, we've talked about that before, to help you understand which of the scenarios that are higher risk, and if there are weaknesses, what recommendations might be applied to it to remove those weaknesses. So that's our key objective, is to go from that design representation to understanding it from a failure representation to documenting it, uncovering weaknesses, and then having improvements. That's where the rubber meets the road in terms of improvements that, that may be needed 
uh, to remove weaknesses and make sure that it's safe enough for employees, the environment, and also the community. So key, key implementation steps. That's the, that's the real magic, and that's what I want to focus on today. 50% um, of the success of a HAZOP study is really preparation. The facilitator understanding the technology, reviewing the drawings, getting key uh, templates in place to help guide the team. It really, it really helps quality. It helps make, make sure the team team's time is properly utilized and effective, and it also keeps the session time minimized. Now, depending on what your objectives are, uh, preparation can save a lot of time, but obviously if you're using a contractor uh, that, that's out there and you're, and you're basically a hired gun as a facilitator, uh, they're going to need a little bit more time to prepare, but you're going to more than make up that, that extra cost or um, associated with the, that additional resource utilization by saving a lot of time from the team where you've got maybe six to eight people sitting around any hour that you save of that team's time translates into a big savings in terms of the overall cost of the HAZOP study. We talked last time about the timeline for preparing for a PHA. Uh, you've got to uh, start well in advance to define objectives and scope, make sure you got the right people invited, the tools arranged, the proper venue, getting the key information. Well, a lot of the key information comes about because a HAZOP study is usually used to tr um, trigger progress for a capital project, it usually tends to come about during the last weeks right before the HAZOP study is scheduled. Uh, the bottom part of your screen, the, one of the final things that happen is you finally get, as a facilitator to prepare for the HAZOP study, the, the final PNIDs or the PNIDs that are going to be used for the HAZOP study. Once you get those, you can actually do the serious preparation in the last stage right before the HAZOP study, defining the nodes right beforehand, preloading the risk ranking matrix, making sure your design intentions and consequence categories are well-defined and binning various types of events as appropriate, uh, making sure your deviation matrix and template are defined and also preloaded into whatever software package you're using, making sure causes are populated. We'll, they, we'll be focusing on that a lot this morning, making sure you prepare training materials, reference materials, getting final copies of the PNIDs and process flow diagrams, ready so that the team can be ready to go when, when you're starting your HAZOP study. Uh, so let's talk about defining the causes. This, this is an art, basically, and it is so important and, and it makes such a difference in the quality and the amount of uh, time that you use for the team. It's really important and that's what I want to focus on for this module. Uh, key types of causes, you know, what can go wrong in a plan site? Usually there are categories in, in three areas, human error, control system malfunctions, or mechanical failures. Um, the reason why they're ordered like this is human error, people making mistakes, whether it be directly pressing the wrong button or not maintaining equipment or um, uh, something else that they missed in terms of the plan operations. These are things that are, are, whether they're subtle and they precipitate into something bigger or a direct causal event to the, uh, to the accident that occurs, all those are very, high, very likely. So you've really got to focus on human error and also human factors issues and we'll be talking a, lot, a little bit more about human factors issues this morning. Uh, I've put some probabilities on the on this slide also to illustrate how likely some of these things are based on reference values that are in literature and also reference values that are used, uh, taken from the CCPS layer protection analysis, that's what CCPS, and, uh, Center for Chemical Process Safety layer protection analysis guidebooks is our key reference point for this. So failure to execute a routine procedure in an unstressed and unfatigued fashion, basically one in a hundred per opportunity of not doing it correctly. Uh, the second bullet, failure to execute non-routine procedures or a routine procedure if stressed or fatigued. Basically, you can get a factor of 10 uh, more likelihood of failure uh, because of the stress factors, the fatigue factors, or basically if they're not executing a, a, a procedure on a routine basis. Uh, especially if it's especially critical for batch processes or unusual operating modes, human errors are especially critical and you've got to pay very critical attention to those. For control system malfunctions, basic process control systems, uh, instrument loop failures are quoted as 0.1 per year also the, out of the LOPA guidebook. Uh, these are things that can occur, that do occur. A lot of people take care of that with smart sensors. They take care of it with voting logic and using multiple detectors. A lot of things can be pulled into play, 
But basic instrument loop failure people usually look at as uh, one in 10 years causing a failure. Uh, mechanical failure examples, things like a safety valve opening spuriously, they usually tag that with um, a 0 0.01 or one in 100 chance per year. Pump seal failures, 0.1 per year. These are the kind of things that can occur and various likelihoods associated with them. Uh, these numbers that are put there, again, are most of them are out of the CC Center for Chemical Process Safety Layer Protection Analysis Guidebook. These are things that are typical screening values, typically conservatively high, just to make sure that you're not missing critical scenarios. Um, how do you deal with that? Again, you're translating on the, on the left-hand side, you see a schematic representation or a, a PID snapshot of a vessel pump and level control feature. Uh, you're translating that into what can go wrong. Um, the possible scenarios that can come out of that are on the upper right-hand side. Level control valve one, failing closed. It's a fail closed valve, possibly due to malfunction of the transmitter controller or block valve inadvertently closed. The level control valve can malfunction open. You'd want to look at that during a HAZOP study too. And also, um, you want to pull out various safeguards. There may be alarms or other features, and those come into play. So again, we're going to translate, uh, the whole HAZOP study translates the functional depiction into a tabular depiction of what possible weaknesses there are. So let's talk about human error a little bit more. Uh, human error, uh, there's various categories of that. Uh, errors of commission where somebody uh, overtly does something that's incorrect. Errors of omission where somebody misses a step or doesn't do something. Or errors of intent where somebody decided to maybe take a shortcut. These are, things, these are core problems that tend to precipitate other types of specific failures. And these are the kind of things that you can quantify and certainly should be considered for the HAZOP study. The kind of impacts these, uh, these have, you might be a, the human error might initiate an event. It might compromise a key safeguard. If there's an important alarm and the operator has to take action, well, that operator action can have some error potential in there. Uh, also compromised emergency response. Uh, if something is confusing, if the equipment doesn't work, um, uh, and the operator has to take some alternative measures, these are all things that can uh, have operator errors uh, come into play. Uh, typical causes, and I'll just throw out some general causes. Um, uh, a diesel air cooler. Okay, uh, what we usually, what we often do is couple, um, if an operator error or mechanical malfunction can cause the same type of event, We'll couple that and we'll look at the same event caused by multiple different things. The first bullet is a uh, louver malfunction in an air cooler, maybe caused by instrumentation failure or inadvertently closed by the operator. So the operator doing something, if that something can also occur, maybe you do a mechanical malfunction or a control system malfunction, this is a good way to link them together. The second bullet, uh, spare diesel uh, product pump inadvertently activated, operator doing something, an error of commission in terms of activating a spare pump can cause potential problems. Other things that can go wrong, a bypass being, valve being inadvertently open, uh, manual valve being inadvertently closed, or potential hazards associated with sampling. All these are types of human errors that you may want to look at uh, during the course of the HAZOP study. What I also want to do is to convey to you the types of human errors that can occur. Uh, there's a, there's a, a very nice human factors training course that was recently put on by Cal OSHA. And what I did is I took some excerpts from that. So as the HAZOP facilitator, I, I mentioned some fundamental human errors and things that you may want to consider. There's a wide range of human factors that can lead to those errors that I wanted to share with you. Um, direct causes can be opening a wrong valve, pushing a wrong button, failing to follow a procedure. These are errors of commission or omission that can result in a potential hazard. These are things that you want to th think about and as appropriate, either couple them with technical failures or uh, in tandem with the technical failure. Uh, when you're looking at human factors or human errors, you want to keep in mind there may be underlying causes for direct causal events, poor design, unclear labeling, the layout of the controls, equipment access, improper placement of equipment, lack of maintenance, inadequate training, fatigue, or inadequate staffing. Maybe those are kind of associated with each other too. But all those can be underlying causes that can lead to specific human errors. So during a HAZOP study, you're going to be identifying and looking at specific human errors. But as a facilitator, you'll want to challenge the team 
to look at potential underlying causes and if there are weaknesses in there that need to be addressed and that you want to flush out as part of the HAZUP study. Uh, some examples of things that are too good. Uh, this is a, I was told this is a photograph from an actual facility. Uh, labeling is poor, trying to find a valve is poor. This is a situation that is very prone to error. I've never seen anything this bad myself, but I have seen situations, especially when you're looking at crude units and you're, you're looking at rundown lines where you can get a lot of crossover connections, where a lot of the configuration can be very confusing, and you've got to be very careful during the HAZUP study to consider those types of events, and during the HAZUP study, or at least as part of the HAZUP study, you'll want to go out and do field walkdowns to kind of take a look at the configuration with the team. Uh, labeling is very important. This is an example of good labeling of piping and a key piece of equipment. Poor labeling. This is something that can lead to human error, contribute to the kind of uh, accidents that are looked at as part of the HAZUP study. Um, different to how, how controls are set up. On the left, on the, on the photograph on the left, you've got a system that it's not readily obvious if things are running smoothly or not. On the right-hand side, the, uh, if gauges, whether they be software controlled, or old-fashioned mechanical gauges, if you've got something that gives you a measure of if you're within safe bounds or not easily, you can, they can be much easier to read and decrease the potential for human error. Uh, looking for causal events, uh, again, the, some of these diagrams, you've got uh, confusion with respect to valves, uh, confusion with respect to buttons, maybe the buttons aren't labeled, maybe they've been worn off, and also you'll want to be looking at incident reports, what kind of things have happened especially if near misses have occurred that have, have led towards an accident but never quite got there because somebody caught it in time. Uh, in the lower right-hand side, somebody not responding properly to an alarm. How many facilities have you been to where you've got multiple alarms going off at once, maybe some that have been ringing continuously because something's out of, out of service or somebody hadn't been doing proper maintenance? An operator's got to keep on top of that, and if all the alarms come in at once and they're not prioritized, it can be awful confusing and decrease the reliability of that safeguard. And while we're talking about safeguards, if you've got a lot of multiple alarms, you've got to be careful how many, not to give multiple credit for multiple alarms that just tell the operator to do the same thing. Even if, uh, if one alarm goes off, it's a clear cause and it leads to the operator taking the correct, the correct corrective action, that's fine there's a certain human error probability associated with that. To alarms, if it's clear and it's, it's directly associated with the causal event, can also help the operator rapidly diagnose the problem and take corrective action. But how much extra does three alarms, does four alarms, five alarms, how much more do they help? One of the key things during a HAZOP study is you want to be careful when you're listing safeguards to only list those safeguards that are directly associated with the cause and are contributory towards improving that ability for the operator to respond. So uh, also in terms of physical layout uh, on the screen, take a look at which, which stove has controls that are clearer. The one in the upper left-hand corner, it's decipherable as long as the labeling is correct and it hasn't worn off. The one in, in the lower left right-hand side hardly needs labeling. There's a direct correlation between the control mechanisms and what you're doing with it. Uh, other problems, matching the job to the worker. Uh, if you've got valves that are up in a pipe rack, difficult for people to get to, uh, it, during an emergency, that's going to decrease the potential for somebody actually taking, uh, taking corrective actions. These are things that need to be considered during the HAZUP study. A typical thing during a HAZUP study, if you're responding to alarms or out in the field, is how much time does the operator have to take the corrective action and can they effectively do it? Stress and fatigue. You know, most, most process facilities are run on a 24-7 basis. Have you made arrangements to make sure that operators have enough stuff to do to keep them alert, but not too much to do so they can't keep up with it? To trying to find that balance between uh, stress, fatigue, getting the job done, and also running your plant safely. Uh, some of the things that have come up during uh, when you're implementing process safety management systems is um, when you're looking at incidents, unclear procedures, not having procedures, communication barriers, lack of labeling, these are key things that do lead to accidents. So these are the things that obviously you want to make sure that you cover properly during your HAZOP study. Other issues associated with operating procedures, again, not having a procedure, uh, not having uh, 
uh, caution warning statements properly in the procedures, steps out of sequence, having procedure titles that don't really match what's doing. And also, we find this a lot, procedures that don't really match with what the operator is doing in the field. Uh, op the procedures are something that should capture operational best practices and be used as a basis for amplifying those best practices and carrying them through for all personnel. And these are things that you need to be looking for during the course of the HAZUP study. Uh, other engineering standards that you need to be thinking about with respect to human factors, color blindness, visual resolution, stress workload, we talked about that already, alarm prioritization we talked about, uh, automation and also control layouts. All these things are important when you're trying to either take credit for operator action to mitigate an event, or you're trying to take credit for the operator doing their job to prevent the event from occurring in the first place. So that pretty much covers the kind of things you want to look at for human error and human factors. What sort of things uh, do you need to look at for control systems? Uh, the first bullet is a temperature transmitter, a temperature transmitter failing low. A lot of times multiple control actions are coming off the same temperature transmitter, so you don't want to necessarily just list the valves that fail. You want to dig down and make sure that you come to the root control, control item, transmitter, or other processor that's feeding all this equipment that could, that could fail and cause problems. The second bullet, heat tracing failures. Heat tracing failures that can result in lower temperatures can often compromise equipment, cause freezing, obviously, and also compromise instrumentation. These things need to be considered during the course of the HAZUP study. Third bullet, the pressure transmitter failing high. Again, if you've got uh, a common mode failure of transmitters, these may be very important to look into. And also utility failures, loss of instrument air, loss of uh, power and other control mechanisms. These are also very important to be looking at. Uh, mechanical failures to consider during the course of the HAZUP study. Uh, two ruptures on heat exchangers. If you've got a heat exchanger, high pressure on one side, low pressure on the other side, you need to be really careful about uh, what the impact is of a tube rupture. Uh, a PSV failing open. I don't know how many times the team says, our PSVs don't fail open, we maintain them. Well, if you look at the, the statistical data of plant sites, their mechanical failures do happen. If a PSV fails open, you want to make sure the system is designed for that. So you want to at least look at it as a credible scenario for your HAZUP study. Uh, check valves failing to receipt. Most people don't want to even credit check valves during the course of the HAZUP study, but if you are, and it's fair that you do, make sure that you look at them as something that is inherently uh, unreliable in that they do leak, and so if you're using them as a barrier from a high pressure system to a low pressure system, you want to be really careful how you're using that. Uh, diesel product air cooler tube ruptures. Again, tube ruptures with air coolers. You can have flammable materials that are coming in um, out of a tube, uh, then the fan pushes them around. You can have all sorts of problems that go on. Also, a lot of these air coolers are elevated, fighting the event, isolate, where are the isolation valves, controlling them afterwards can be really critical. So these are the kind of things you want to bring out during a HAZUP study. I remember one we were looking at for a fin fan cooler, and the, iso the only isolation valve that was practical for isolating the release was right next to the cooler on the platform. So getting to that during an emergency, especially if, a leak occurred, it found an ignition source, and there was a fire going on. It could be really challenging if you're trying to isolate the fuel source and, and, and mitigate the event. Uh, bottom one, uh, pump seal failures. A lot of pumps are now being installed. Uh, people are putting the extra money up front to prevent problems later with uh, dual tandem seals and also monitoring devices and better quality seals so that it decreases the likelihood of this, but you still have to be very careful. A seal failure often, if you're looking at a refinery or other types of process facility, can result in a fire condition, but you also, during the HAZUP study, want to look at what else is laden in that, um, that, that flow stream. Could it be H2S or some other toxic material? Let's talk about common mode failures. These can be really critical. The diagram that you see on the left is a common push-pull system for a blanket gas on a process vessel. In this case, you got a 30 PSI design pressure, normally operating at 10, levels controlled, you got a pump coming out, and pressure is controlled with a 70 PSI source and, and when, when you need to make up pressure, and also it bleeds to vapor recovery when you need to bleed off pressure. You got, a, in this case, a single pressure transmitter 
feeding both the valve coming in and also the valve that relieves the, the vapors. Uh, this is something that a lot, classically a lot of people have looked at this and, and when they're looking at failures, go like, okay, my inlet valve opens up with the impact and taking credit for the valve on the outlet opening up to relieve pressure. You've got to be very sensitive to the fact that you're using common transmitters and controllers and the fact that, the, that, that a common mode failure here can lead to pressure coming in and an inability to, for pressure to be relieved here through the normal vapor recovery line, thereby requiring your PSV as your, as your ultimate protection device. So in terms of laying that out, you'd want to look specifically at your pressure transmitter failing low or high, looking at the valves themselves, opening or closing as a separate issue, not combining them together because that common mode failure could be much more important and also quite likely, and also considering these types of failures when you're looking at the safeguards. Uh, again, common mode failures, what's one of the most important things to look at? What can go wrong at a facility? Operator action or inaction, whether it be in response to an alarm, whether it be a maintenance person who's been doing the same procedure for maintaining relief valves that's incorrect for your entire facility. These are things that need to be considered during the HAZOP study, and human errors uh, and operator issues are paramount to look at very carefully. Uh, let's also talk about a couple of other topics. Um, combining causes, I mentioned before in some of the examples where we've taken mechanical failures, instrumentation failures, and operator um, actions or inactions and put them in with the same scenario, in the same cause. The reason is it leads to the same consequences, and so other than some differences in probability, which you may want to consider when you're looking at a layer protection analysis or some other QRA technique, you really want to couple those together to make sure the team is focusing on the same consequence in the same type of scenario. The first example is a temperature control valve failing closed, possibly due to malfunction of the transmitter or a block valve being inadvertently closed. All three of those specific initiating events lead to the same consequences, so if it doesn't change your result and you're evaluating it properly, combining causes can save a lot of team time and also leads you to con your conclusion and have much cleaner documentation as long as you're properly considering all those different failure modes. Also, the, uh, the same cause in multiple locations. I, I don't know how many times that, that I've had to stop a team from arguing is something a no-flow or a high-level type issue. Uh, it, it really, in a lot of cases, it doesn't matter. What I tend to want to do is document it in the area where it has the greatest impact. If, if loss of flow can trigger an immediate uh, challenge of your safety limits and a potential hazard, then in this first bullet, a level control valve failing closed would be good to put in the flow area. That's kind of a logical place to do. Um, you, could, you could put it in the level area, but in a case where its biggest impact is on flow, putting it there, doing it up front, getting it done right is, is, is going to be a good way to go. So what you want to do is not document the same scenario twice. I, I don't know how many revalidations I've picked up where somebody else has done it, and they, they have this big, long discussion about a level control valve, and often if it's, if it's a sloppy job, they don't put, put in tag numbers properly, about a level control valve failing, and they, they lead to this scenario. Then later on, when you get to the, the uh, level deviations, they talk about a level control valve, and it leads to different consequences and you're thinking it's a different level control valve, and then you're going back to research it, and you're really finding out that they're really talking about the same device. They've just done a very poor job in documenting it, and, and doing it twice, especially if it doesn't match, really confuses the revalidation. It doesn't do the job any better. In fact, it's, it's more, worse by a lot, by extremes, as a matter of fact. So doing it once, and if you have to, referencing back to a previous scenario where it's evaluated properly and thoroughly, is a great way to go. Now, there may be some exceptions, um, but for the most part, documenting it once and only in one place uh, works 99% of the time. And also, uh, what we find works best is we usually take the flow deviations, the no flows, more flows, and misdirected flows first. Those tend to, to lead to the, to the best conclusions and also have the biggest impacts. Uh, completeness checks. This is something I like to do when I do a HAZOP study. Uh, even though up front we do, um, we use a highlighter, define the node, 
and uh, then we use that to explain it to the team, and then we go through on a cause by cause basis to do the um, uh, to, to do the HAZOP study. The uh, on a separate PNID, I'll usually leave it blank, and after we do all the deviations associated with piece of equipment, I'll usually check it off, and at the end of it, and I'll usually involve the team. I'll review the entire node with the team, re-highlight the node just to make sure that um, there's a complete job done and that we picked up all readily identifiable failure modes associated with equipment. Again, that's a key thing in terms of uh, verifying that you've done a quality job for a hands-up study. Let's talk about operating modes. This is something I mentioned before that can really wrap a team around the axle uh, in terms of confusion, them overthinking the scenario. Uh, a typical um, example would be a reactor system where you're switching back and forth as you're regenerating one. Uh, also, a reverse osmosis system if you're switching back and forth again during a regeneration phase. And a lot of times there's a lot of manual valves or remotely operated valves that have to be sequenced to, to flip from one to the other. And uh, these different the sequencing operations, the different configurations of valves, if you approach it with, let's all think about normal operation, let's all think about regeneration mode, let's all think about these other modes, it really makes the team rethink the same hazards over and over and over again. So what I, what I find works well is to really a, a simple approach where you look at each specific equipment like you would for, for any, any normal process that's operating 100% of the time, and you look at the component, and then you ask the team, what's the worst operating mode for this particular component in failure mode? And then you document that. And sometimes they need to look at a couple of different operating modes, but when it's all said and done, we usually do a very good, thorough job. You know you've looked at all the equipment, you've looked at all the operating modes, and then you've documented the ones that make sense and have an impact. So we usually just put it in the, in the cause, in capital letters, and these are some examples of that that I put on the screen. Uh, other things that are very operating mode dependent are heat, fired heaters. A good percentage of accidents at facilities like process facilities that use fired heaters are associated with that, whether it be startup, shutdown, reduced firing conditions, load changes, uh, whether you've got um, alternate fuel compositions. Some, sometimes they'll switch from oil to natural gas to refinery fuel gas. All those things tend to be potentially problematic the system's being reconfigured, and you have to be really careful about the operating modes that you're looking at. Startup especially, looking at the procedures, talking to the team, this is, when it, this is the most common time for accidents, so this is where you might want to look, do a procedure level review and make sure that you discuss all those different operating modes with, with the personnel at, on the team very thoroughly. The last one, it's an oddball, but I've seen this happen maybe one in 20, for one in 20 heaters. Somebody's got a, a non-combustible that's being blended in with the fuel gas going into the heater, or sometimes it's injected into the, directly into the firebox or into the uh, flue area. Sometimes it's done for uh, getting by uh, so they don't have to do separate permits for getting rid of a, some sort of waste gas stream. Uh, sometimes there are other reasons for doing it, but you've got to be extremely careful in a situation like this because under low fire conditions for a heater, if you get a high concentration of non-flammable gases going into the heater, you can cause a flame out and buildup of, of whatever uh, flammables are there to a concentration where you can cause heater explosions. These things are things that you want to be especially careful of if you're facilitating a hazard study. So defining the causes up front and before the team, as we talked about in our timeline earlier, is really critical and it saves a lot of time. Uh, we've talked about ways to do that, the kind of causes to look at, and I've even given you some patterned words of typical causes. Probably about 95% of anything you'll see for a HAZOP study has been in this presentation in terms of how to deal with it, how to, how to spell it out, and really getting that template together so that when, uh, when you get that team together, you've got, uh, as a facilitator, you've got a mechanism to make sure that you do a thorough job for at least all the basic stuff that you can identify up front, it helps keep the team focused, and, and it really helps you keep the team moving as you're doing the facilitation. Now, another part of that that's heavily equipment-oriented is defining the safeguards. As you remember, we did talk about how to de de uh, deal with consequences in Module 2. 
uh, defining the safeguards is something we want to do right now. Um, a key thing to think about is timing and the priority for the safeguards. The first thing you want to do is talk about eliminating the causes and then mitigating the consequences. So listing out the safeguards in a logical fashion that makes sense and does justice to that makes is very effective and it's very useful if you're revalidating it later. To the extent practical, you also want to list them in chronological order. Uh, this helps the team understand what's happening and really understanding the scenario, and we'll talk more about that in a couple of minutes. Uh, active control features, control valves that either control pressure, temperature, or level. These are things that initially can be your initial safeguard. Control features are fine to include as safeguards. It doesn't have to be just safety instrumented systems or just operator response to, to possibly exceeding safety limits via alarms. Active control features are fine safeguards. They're reliable, why not include them? Uh, reverse flow protection, if a check valve helps, list it out. Then the team can decide how reliable the check valve is based on service, design, and if it's a valid safeguard. Alarms, again, uh, excuse me for a second. Uh, alarms are really good to include as long as the operator has time to properly to hear the alarm. Are they at the control console all the time? Have they stepped out for a minute? Uh, can they hear the alarm? How long does that take? Um, then can, how long does it take to diagnose the event? Decide what to do. Get approvals if necessary for supervisors, from supervisors, and then take corrective action. Do they have to just push a button? Is the action clear? Do they, is it, do they know exactly what to do and are they trained? Do they have to go out in the field to turn something? Is it a, a 30 inch valve that might take a little bit to close? These are things that have to be considered when you credit alarms. And if multiple alarms result in the same action, as I mentioned before, if one alarm is clear and the operator can clearly diagnose the event, 10 alarms may be worse. It may cause confusion. Um, and you want to consider that during the hands up study. Listing multiple alarms may not, don't, shouldn't be treated as independent safeguards or necessarily adding to the reliability of the system if the operator still, you're still dependent on the operator to go through those steps to diagnose and take corrective action. Written procedures, when they're considered, make sure it'd be, it's best to actually list them out and specify what procedure you're talking about, whether you're talking about operations, maintenance, or even emergency procedures. Training, if you're mentioning training, what kind of training has occurred, and ask the team, is the training adequate? Also, active protection features, safety instrumented systems, and other things that are ultimate backups. PSVs, all those are, are fine safety features. Uh, also, emergency response mitigation features like fire, uh, like deluge systems, et cetera, those can also be listed. Uh, good examples of all these for active control features, a pressure control valve designed to open and flow fuel gas. Reverse flow protection check valves, as I mentioned. Alarms, uh, in this case, it's a high level alarm. And, and what I like to do is also ask the team, um, what is that alarm doing? Where does the alarm come in? And is there sufficient time for the operator to take corrective action? So I actually use a few extra words when I'm documenting the safeguard to remind the team to be thinking about these things and only credit alarms that actually are useful for mitigating the scenario. Um, and also don't forget, uh, analyzers too can also have alarm uh, features on them that can be very helpful for the operator to diagnose something and take corrective action. Uh, written procedures and training. Again, I mentioned this uh, just generally. If you're crediting training and procedures, and also what are they looking at? Be as specific as possible. If it's surveillance of process parameters, what process parameters, what are they looking at? Also active protection features, um, low, low uh, flow uh, features that are designed to activate something, and also what, what happens after that. I usually like to lay that out so the team thinks about it. Also, there may be discrepancy alarms and other more advanced uh, control features. You want to bring those into play also when you're looking at safeguards. Uh, other examples, snuffing steam, uh, fire water monitors, all those can be brought in with respect to emergency response mitigation features. I, I mentioned I was going to remind you about a couple of quality issues. Scenarios really should paint a picture of the event. When you document, when you talk to the team, when you lay it out for the team, 
and um, you need to make sure that people can read that later and understand what's happening. They should have a mental picture of the accident that's occurring. Safeguards have to mitigate the consequence. A lot of people put, I've seen uh, HAZUP studies that people have thrown at me that were done by uh, other individuals that where the uh, safeguards had nothing to do with the consequences. They were just having a random discussion and the facilitator hadn't prepared themselves properly so that they understood enough about the system to recognize that the team was just rambling on and talking about general safeguards rather than safeguards directly associated with that consequence. And also, listing, one of the things we've been doing more and more over the years is listing safeguards as independent layers of protection. As I mentioned in our pre, some of the previous modules, HAZOP studies is one type of tool to identify hazards and address the features of the regulations and also protecting your facility. Other more advanced tools such as layer protection analysis and QRA are also available and, it's, and these things can be linked. If you list your safeguards, thinking about are there independent protection layers? If you got multiple alarms, is it only one operator action? And usually what we'll do is list the operator action which is triggered by one, of, one or more alarms and then list the alarms as one part of one item. Listing them as independent layers of protection can allow you to easily migrate this to a LOPA later on if you like to. So let's talk about, um, uh, nor normally I would do this if it was a one-in-one -one interaction with a, a classroom, but let me go through some key, key points in terms of a, a quiz. Um, true or false, basically, defining causes before the HAZAP study is a good use of time. That's absolutely true. When, when you've taken the, the time to lay it out, prepare properly, and also get the causes laid out, it, it saves a lot of team time, and you've also got a framework for making sure you get a good quality job done. Uh, second one here, structuring a safeguard as an IPL can facilitate trans transition to LOPA. This is absolutely true. It's not only clear, it's logical, but also it enables you to, to build on that if you need to use LOPA to help with your decision-making process. Operator action or inaction is one of the most important common mode failures to, to consider. Absolutely true. That can be a root cause, whether it be an indirect cause, such as somebody maintaining a piece of equipment or directly causing a problem in the plant. That's something that needs to be considered during a HAZOP study, and it's a potentially critical common mode failure that needs to be addressed very clearly as part of the HAZOP study. That's why we spent some time on human factors. Uh, fourth bullet, success isn't dependent on preparation. That's absolutely false. Preparing for, for a HAZOP study is a lot like preparing for anything in your career. Uh, good preparation can lead to successful results, and in this case, a tangible cost benefit by doing upfront work to minimize team time and keep the team focused, too. Uh, com last one, combining causes can save time, enhance the quality of the HAZOP study, and make revalidation easier. That's absolutely correct. Now, there are cases where you want to split them up, and we did talk about common mode failures, but generally, combining the causes that lead to the same consequence makes a lot of sense. All right, I'm going to come back to this in a few minutes, and what I'd like to do is switch over to the workshop, and I'm going to lead into that, and we're going to go to Module 4B. Okay, very good. Nicole, are you, are you there? All right, you see that? Okay, if we, if we start deviating, just let me know. <laughs> All right, so what I'd like to do is, again, this is a little challenging because of a webinar type situation but I want to lead you uh, to, to a work, handhold you through a, work, a, a little workshop that kind of emphasizes the cause definition and also uh, no definition and also cause definition too. Uh, but first I want to remind you about some key issues with respect to node selection. Nodes or the sections that you typically, that you put together are typically defined before the PHA system uh, sessions. I have seen cases where the facilitator walks into a HAZOP study with a blank sheet of paper and then talks to the team and says, oh, let's start defining our nodes. Uh, that basically blows the better part of a day. 
and it's it's very ineffective. It goes around in circles. And the the key thing is a lot of times the team isn't very experienced in doing the HAZAP study. And as the facilitator, as a trained facilitator, you know what to expect and how to set it up properly so it can be effectively uh, revalidated later. Uh, nodes typically begin where feed enters the plant and follows the process through the product leaving the plant. Uh, nodes include major vessels or equipment and the process lines between. And also, you may want to cover auxiliary systems in a separate node. And as I mentioned previously, make sure the nodes are as large as practical. What you want to do is when the team has to consider uh, those dyna process dynamics and what goes on at the facility, you want to make sure that they think about uh, similar events at the same time. Okay, some good examples of node selection. Uh, on your screen, you see a blue vessel on the left on level control uh, with pump out on the bottom going through a heat exchanger uh, and through the level control valve and then into another process vessel. The areas in blue basically are, are undergoing a common function. If you're talking about level fluctuations in the tank, well, things like the pump failure, things like valve failures, those are associated with that. If you're talking about the, the upfront process vessel and equipment, if you're looking at pressure issues, well, closing off a valve downstream of a pump can lead to a pressure issue. Temperature issues, if you're, if you're talking about a heat exchanger, whether you're talking about a cooler or if you're exchanging with another um, a process fluid as an economizer, these are things that are looked at with the temperature deviation. So coupling them together like this allows you to go through the HAZAP steady deviations very effectively, and grouping them like this really helps out a lot. A really bad example, and I have seen lots of these when I've revalidated other people's work, has been when they take each process component and make a separate note out of them. They look, they look at the blue vessel, the vessel in blue on the left, and they they go like, okay, this is something that we need to look at level issues, pressure issues, temperature issues, etc. Then they go down to the pump and run through the same process, and they're essentially looking at the same issue, and the worst part about it is a lot of times they're not connecting the dots and making sure that when they talk about the same issue, they're actually getting the same results. So again, coupling together areas where you're looking at the same kind of process dynamics really helps out a lot. A very effective example that is um, a little bit off the wall and, and you get a little bit of a pushback as a facilitator but you just got to tell the team to bear with you and try it out, is something like you see here. In, in a situation like this where you've got a uh, liquids coming in, a, uh, a feed vessel, pump, flow on, and then flow control going through an economizer exchanger, through a heater, and then into a reactor, and then back to the economizer, uh, these are things that uh, we found. This is a typical setup um, for, say, a hydro-treating hydro plant, and we found that when you do this, Making that first area as one node actually makes a lot of sense, and it works very well. You deal with pressure issues in the push-pull system on the, uh, the feed drum. You're dealing with level issues on the feed drum. The uh, pump and flow control valve, the no-flow issues that also translate into level. And between, in these typical flow streams, especially at the front end of a hydro treater, there's not a lot of control required. So there's not a lot of active components between that flow control valve that you're looking at and the reactor effluent. So in a situation like that, you really find out that, that you can go through that entire area for the HAZOP study very simply. You're talking about the same kind of uh, consequence phenomenology at the same time, and it's, it's very clean and it's easy to find stuff later. So think about process dynamics, what's happening with the system as you're defining the nodes. Now you also notice that uh, beneath the heater, it is a fired heater, there are some red lines Typically what we find is for a fire heater, the, the fire control system, any sort of, um, uh, uh, the, any sort of uh, flow of the uh, combustion air, all those things are good to address as part of a separate, uh, separate node. Uh, other node selection tips, um, keep colors simple. Uh, when, uh, again, we do a lot of uh, work over long periods of time with facilities and uh, over the years, and especially if we're picking up revalidations that where somebody else has done the HAZOP study, if they use the uh, 20 color uh, highlighter set, a lot of times over the years, those colors tend to get affected by UV light. They, they change their tone, and it's really tough to tell any differences after a certain period of time. 
Uh, it gets even worse if you take that and put it on a scanner and they scan the drawings even with a color scanner. The, the color doesn't really match the, the initial ones. So keep it a few basic colors so they can be differentiated later. Uh, also, we tend to uh, highlight uh, PDF files so they can be useful later. And in fact, that's the one that's being used for our little workshop this morning. So let's, talk, let's do a little exercise for defining the nodes. And what I'm going to do is switch over to um, a PDF file and just the first page, if you wouldn't mind. All right, you got that? Okay, great. All right, so this is a, um, a small example from a refinery process. Basically, you've got feed coming in through, through reactor, um, I'm sorry, through heater, then reactors, and basically you got a process separator as it's coming out of that. Um, feed comes in on the upper left-hand side, and the, the, uh, basically the project is going out on the right-hand side. Um, that's what you see on your screen. So what, what I would do with this in terms of defining the nodes, and that's what you see on your screen now in yellow, is basically take the feed coming in uh, from the upper left-hand side on flow control, going through your, um, your heat exchangers that economize the heat from the reactor effluent, and then to heater 001, and then to the inlet of the reactor. That works really well because you get a few active components and you've got very similar impacts on all your heat exchangers as they come in. Uh, what I would do with that for a second node is to follow the process and basically take the reactor itself and the effluent going back to the heat exchangers that you will have just discussed with the team and then finally to a, um, a fin fan cooler on its way into the, the product separator. That's the main flow of the process. After that, I would take it and I would take it through the, from the product separator and really look at that. The team's really familiar with the feed coming into the unit, uh, picking up heat and going into the reactor, coming out, releasing its heat, going through the fin fan cooler and also the product separator. And that's where I would put the third node and that's what you're seeing in pink. Uh, the fourth node is since the team's already talking about the, pro the product separator. And again, another thing you want to keep in mind when you're defining the nodes is how do you control the team thinking about process dynamics and hazards associated with the system? So as much as possible, you want to follow the process and avoid jumping around. Sometimes you can't avoid that because you've got to pick up similar types of events. Or in some cases, gosh, if you're discussing um, a lube oil system for a very large process unit, you may have multiple lube oil systems that have similar functions. Maybe that's a utility system that you save to the end and then do one and do it right and then copy it over and do them all with the team at the same time for efficiency and while they're thinking about it. That's another way to pick up time and also do a really good quality job. So if you've just finished the uh, product separator, the next logical thing to do is to the separator knockout pot D005. That's the area that you see in blue. I would make that node four. Uh, another, another thing that we've got is we got other materials going through the heater uh, it's, it is a separate, basically a separate process, but this is a good time to pick it up. And I wouldn't separate out the material going into the heater and the material going out of the heater. This is a good time to pick up the whole thing. And since you've just discussed both parts of the heater, node six I would make that's in yellow on the lower left-hand side, I would, I would pick up the firing system next on that and make that one node. And for this type of uh, process, the last piece is basically in the upper right-hand side uh, which is associated with the, uh, the suction knockout pot. These are the th sort of things that would be picked up last and basically complete this portion of the process. Uh, notice that we've been doing defining the nodes on the process flow diagram. Even though the PNIDs have more information in terms of understanding the process and setting it up so that you've got uh, dynamics that you want to work with the team on, this is, this is very effective. And, um, and it also keeps, allows you to focus as a facilitator, constantly seeing the big picture so that you can guide the team. As a reminder, the HAZOP facilitator, you've got to be talking about what you just discussed with the scribe sometimes or make sure the documentation's in tune, discussing things with the team, and you've also got to be thinking ahead so you can properly lead or guide the team and facilitate that HAZOP study. 
understanding the process and really keeping track of where you are with the process flow diagram is very helpful. Whenever I'm facilitating a HAZOP study, I usually have both pre-noted right in front of me so I can keep track of where I am and where I'm going. All right, so that concludes our um, discussion of nodes, uh, or that's our, our, our workshop in terms of how to set up nodes. Now, what I'd like to do best is talk about defining causes. And this is a small uh, portion, just portion of a process where you've got on the left-hand side, Nicole, do you have this on screen? Okay, good. Um, it's a, it's a uh, small tank where you've got on level control where the vapors are coming off, going off to an air cooler, a, a trim cooler, and then to another process vessel where you've got, in this case, water and hydrocarbons being separated, water coming off to the boot on the left, and hydrocarbons coming off to the boot on the right. So what I'd like to do is go through that and first of all, talk about what the nodes would be, and then secondly, talk about um, what kind of causes would make sense. Okay, the first node that I would uh, pick up on that uh, would be uh, D906, and the, the level control off of that going off to the hot separated liquid on the lower right-hand side. Uh, the other node that I would define for that is uh, the vapors coming off of D906, going through XF913, X914, into D907, where they get separated. You may have some vapors coming off. That's not shown, by the way. Or, and then you've got some water and also some hydrocarbons coming off the bottom. So I'd like to for you to use that diagram, and what I'd like to do is to run through some basic causes. So what I'd like to do, Nicole, is go to 4D. All right, so this is the exercise we're doing on key causes. All of you who are tuned into the webcast have a physical copy of the uh, of that small P and ID. And so what I'd like to do is is hold your hand, hold hands, and hold your hand through the little workshop and define some causes here. All right, so node one is D906 in the level control valve. So let's talk about some no flow items. Um, what sort of things would, would would you look at as a team for no flow? Well, this is really a very simple one. The, the major active component there, and by the way, another thing you need to do for a HAZOP study is separating the important from the unimportant. On this diagram, there's lots of valves, there's lots of manual valves, but, but right, and there's also a lot of valves that are shown for instrument loops, but recognize when you're looking at a valve on a level bridle, closing that, compromising that, it's gonna have the same effect as if the level transmitter fails. If you're looking at a level control valve, that valve closing is gonna have the same effect as if the block valve is closed. So combining those, simplifying it, and looking at the things that are really important is absolutely critical. So for D906, you'd look at that and then you'd, you know, you realize that the, that block valves and the bridle really aren't gonna to add to it because you're gonna, you're gonna cover the level transmitter. The block valves around the level control valve 15 uh, aren't going to do much more. You're going to be looking at that level control valve uh, failing closed. So really, from a no-flow perspective, you're going to capture everything with just by a single scenario, LV, LCV 015 failing closed or possibly due to a transmitter malfunction or a block valve inadvertently closed. That's going to encapsulate your key no-flow item for this. For more flow, you're going to be looking at that level control valve. By the way, you guys don't have a hard copy to this. Uh, I want you to be thinking about this as we're going through it, and I want you to work off of this drawing right here. Okay? Um, uh, for a more flow case, the level control valve malfunctioning open is going to cover, the, and of course you have to ask this, but usually the bypass valve is about the same size. It's going to cover the bypass valve being open, the valve malfunctioning open, or to some sort of transmitter failure. And I usually work it back to the transmitter because sometimes the uh, controller can, um, there can be multiple controllers, and sometimes it leads back to a single transmitter. So you always want to get to the root part of the control system that can fail. Uh, so these are the key scenarios that you're gonna, that are really gonna encompass the embodiment of the hazards for this node one that we've defined. So let's take a look at node two. All right, as we exit D906, again, we're looking at the vapor path through XF913, 
X914, and then over to D907, and then we got some level control valves coming off of that. Well, following the process, again, is really important for the team's understanding uh, what are some of the no-flow things that can, can occur? Well, uh, XF913 can uh, undergo fouling. You want to ask the team to think about that. Um, there's also block valves upstream and downstream of 914. And also, as you uh, exit D907, you got level control valve 010 on the hydrocarbon side. And I like to, uh, by the way, there's a typo here, LCV907. That really should be LCV011. That valve can be now uh, failing closed, also to cause no flow. So the key no flow cases that I'd want to look at for no two, and they're written out here. By the way, I'll be we'll be emailing a copy of these results from our workshop to everybody who's participating here, uh, in case you're trying to scribble these down quickly. Uh, but um, it's the uh, effluent air cooler fouling, the block valve upstream of the trim cooler closed the block valve downstream closed, LV10 malfunction closed, or LV11 failing closed. Now, a couple of key things that I'd like to bring out here. For the first no-flow case, a lot of times when dealing with clean service, fouling of equipment is very unlikely. And so developing a full HAZOP scenario where you start documenting all the consequences and you know, then and finally concluding it, that it's a non-issue is really, in many cases, a bad use of some very valuable resources, which is your HAZOP study team. So if it's a clean service and it's like, not very likely that fouling can build up enough to actually cause enough compromised flow to really precipitate a hazard, why not just say that up front? Get the team to endorse it. Make sure you talk to them about the things that really are important, which are their procedures, how they monitor it, how they check for fouling, are they monitoring the overall process efficiency, and that's, that's what you want to verify, and if that's the case, keep, it, keep the documentation simple. So in a lot of cases, I'll just basically take an unlikely event or something that really doesn't result in a consequence and nip it in the bud early and just verify that how they deal with their system with the team. Uh, the second item on that list, a lot of times you'd kind of combine block valves. If you notice when you're talking about level control valve in node one, we really didn't talk about the block valve upstream or the block valve downstream because it really didn't make a difference. Here you've got, you need to be sensitive to design pressures and do things make a difference. Combining stuff is great, but you never want to lose sight of the fact that you may in this case have to pick up on the fact that uh, XF913 is designed for 850 PSIG. D906 is also designed for 850 PSIG, but X914 is only designed for 550 PSIG. That's not that much of a difference in pressure, but you don't want to presume as a somebody who's not the designer of the system or the operator of the system, you're the facilitator getting prepared for your HAZOP study. You don't want to presume that it's fine. You want to at least set it up so that it prompts the question to be asked if, it, if it's blocked downstream and can X914 be pressurized above its design pressure even though the other pieces of equipment are, are just fine and happy. So that's why you might want to separate it here. The upstream consequence and the downstream consequence may be very different. And also, you want to bring out here, there, I see a PSV on D907, but I don't see one on D906. So if you close those out, does it uh, block off a communication path for overpressure protection? Do you need to talk to the team about car sealing open, locking open those valves, or some other means of overpressure protection? These are all things that need to be come up during the HAZOP study. And as the facilitator preparing for that HAZOP study, you want to make sure that you set it up so that it prompts the questions. And because you can't always count on the team to be really thinking outside of the box. Keep in mind that as a, as a seasoned HAZOP study facilitator, you're used to thinking about how can things go wrong. Your team in operations or design are usually thinking how to make things work. That's a totally different way of looking at the world, and your perspective on this, if you set the HAZOP study up properly, is very valuable to them for good quality HAZOP. Um, the last two, 
I want to bring out the fact that, first of all, we are coupling in the transmitter human error and, uh, and mechanical malfunctions because they lead to the same consequence. Again, you'll want to challenge the team during the case, it, during the session, if that's not the case. But one of the things that has caused confusion with the teams in the past is usually valves that are, that are um, especially if they're air operated, have a specific failure mode if the air operator is removed or if you lose instrument air. Uh, a fail close valve will close, will, will have a spring. It will close the valve if you lose the instrument error. A fail open valve will have a spring that opens the valve if you lose instrument error or some other mechanism of achieving that function. So to avoid confusion, if a fail closed valve is closing, usually you'll say it fails closed. If it's a fail open valve, it's failure mode, preferred failure mode is fail open. And if it's closing, usually you'll say malfunction closed. And that avoids uh, confusion with the team. Okay, so let's talk about more flow cases. Um, in this particular case, you've got, uh, there's not a whole lot more flow that can go on with XF913 or X914. And you could look at the bypass valve on X914 as possibly a more flow case. However, keep in mind that um, when you bypass a heat exchanger like this, the biggest impact may be temperature. So in this particular case, you will think ahead and realize that it might not be a flow issue, but more of a temperature issue. So you're going to hold off on that bypass be valve being open until you're ready to talk about temperature. So key more flow cases associated with this, this node might be associated with those level control valves. So for a more flow case, uh, we've got LV10, which is a fail open valve, failing open. We got LV11, which is a fail closed valve, malfunctioning open both of those causing more flow, and also picking up if the bypass valve is inadvertently open, also causing more flow. And of course, when you, when you look at the consequences, you're going to talk about level decrease and what the consequences of that are. Okay, for misdirected flow, misdirected flow, we tend to pick up a lot of uh, abnormal valve configurations or other things that go wrong with the system. In this particular case, it's a good opportunity to pick up, as we mentioned before, two ruptures. Well, 913 is a fin fan cooler, so a release of hydrocarbons could cause a nasty fire if it finds an ignition source. That's certainly worth looking at. And you want to talk about the metallurgy of the tubes, um, how they inspect the tubes. You want to talk about fire protection and also emergency isolation. Uh, trim cooler 914, totally different situation. There, if you have a tube rupture, you may have a fairly high pressure stream going into a fairly low pressure cooling water system. What are the implications of getting hydrocarbons in there? What are the implications of getting pressure over there? And we'll talk about PSVs in a few minutes. So these are the things you want to pick up in terms of misdirected flow. And also PSV 907 on top of V907. This is a pressure safety valve. What if it fails open? Is it going, can the, can the sort, place, it, <coughs> place that it's going to, can it accommodate it properly? Okay, so let's talk about uh, some temperature issues for this node. Uh, there's a lot going on with respect to temperature. XF913, fin fan cooler 914, those, those are going to be situations where you want to look at things like fan failures. You want to look at things like loss of cooling water. <clears throat> and you also want to look in this case about the bypass valve being opened up. So in terms of setting that up, when you're looking at the fin fan cooler, what happens if you lose one or more active fans? What about tube side fouling? If the thing gets fouled, whereas from a flow impact, it wasn't going to compromise flow that much, it could have a real significant impact with respect to uh, possibly over uh, causing a high t a temperature excursion in downstream equipment. Also, from the fan failure perspective, getting that high temperature material going uh, hitting X914. Is it designed for that? Can you exceed uh, tube metallurgy limits? Can you cause thermal shock? There's a lot of things that you need to look at, and these types of causal events will help pick that up during the HAZUP study. Cooling water, what if it's isolated? Um, what if you isolate both valves? In this case, you want to you look at an individual valve being isolated or both valves being isolated, because I'm not seeing a PSV on this. 
such that you've got a high temperature stream and if you block it in and you, you're heating up the water then they're blocked in conditions that might exceed two, two pressure design limits. So this is another causal event that you want to prepare in advance to prompt the question. And if, there, if the team says, oh, there's a PSV there, we just didn't draw it in there, well, you make a drawing correction, you document that, and then you move on. But preparing in advance and making sure that you look at this kind of scenario will make sure that you prompt that. By the way, a lot, the other way a lot of people have addressed this is by locking open the, the discharge valve on the, on the cooling water return. Um, another thing you want to look at is uh, what if there are variations in cooling water temperature. Well, usually cooling water temperature is pretty stable, so it's not going to have a big impact. In most cases, and it's also often under control, it's not going to have a big impact. And if it's true, there's no need to belabor it. Just document it as the causal event that's not likely to represent a hazard and then just move on. And also you got a bypass valve on the trim cooler. This is a good time to pick it up. So what about low temperature events? Well, you've also got fans. So maybe if you're running one, uh, maybe getting a second one on could be problematic. So you want to look at that under low temperature. And also you want to talk about fluctuations in cooling water temperature that may or may not be an impact. Now, in, and also for some climates, extreme northern climates, uh, there are louvers that are on the, these and also steam systems to keep the uh, internals for the, uh, the fin fan cooler from freezing. Those are things that you may want to also come into play when you're looking at low temperature issues. For this particular system, since there are no louvers and there's no steam uh, inlet to the, the cooler, that's really not an issue. So inadvertent activation of a fan and also maybe looking at cooling water supply temperature decreases that would be as far as I'd want to go with that. All right, so this is an example, and I'll be sending the results to you from this workshop of some of the key things that can come out of, uh, of these causal events when you're preparing them in advance. Again, it's important to think ahead, be specific, try to anticipate what the team is going to have to evaluate it, and making sure that when you frame out and prepare that has up study, that you've got a framework for challenging the team making sure that you can keep pace, that you don't miss key potential issues, and that it's properly documented, and documented in a manner, and that's why we try to provide this logical approach to facilitate later revalidation. That's the key thing that a lot of people don't think about, especially if you're a, uh, designing the process or, you're, or it's part of a capital improvement project. If you're doing a uh, HAZOP study for something that's on the drawing board, sooner or later, somebody's gonna have to operate it uh, subsume it into their PSM program and work with it and revalidate it later. So doing a good job on the HAZOP study up front is part of, uh, if you're designing it, doing a good job for your client, and if you're operating the facility, something that you really need. And whether you're an onshore facility and governed by PSM, RMP, or you're an offshore facility being governed by the new safety environmental management system requirements, all of those pivot on a good quality hazard analysis. Anyhow, thank you, and I uh, wanted to let you know that um, uh, December 16th is our next module, and we're going to be focusing on facilitation tips and also different ways of applying PHA techniques during the design cycle. I will be providing the results of our workshop uh, by email, and if you have any questions at any time, uh, the, there's, by the way, we're going to open up for questions now, which you can ask. Um, uh, to Nicole via the chat window, or we can bring you in on audio. But if you have any questions at any time, please feel free to call me, and I'll be glad to um, offer my two cents on the situation. Okay, very, very good. Great question. Great question. Um, if the, the answer is no, all right, if you're lived, oh, um, that was, thank you, thank you. All right, the question was, if a team identifies lifting a relief valve, a PSV, as the consequence, is that an acceptable consequence? Uh, is, is that an acceptable consequence to document for the HAZOP study? Uh, the answer is no. Um, the uh, consequences should be the ultimate consequences carrying the event through uh, with, without safeguards being activated. A PSV is a safeguard. By activating the PSV, you're, you're exceeding design limits, 
unless the PSC opening pressure wasn't matched with the vessel design pressure. So if you're exceeding design limits, you really need to document the, as the consequence exceeding those design limits and what the impact is. The PSV is a safeguard. So lifting, the safe, lifting a PSV would not be a good consequence. You really need to challenge the team and move past that. Okay, the question was if the consequences identified are operational issues, is more documentation needed? Um, the answer is it depends. If the objectives of the HAZOP study, and you want to clear this with the, uh, operating, the company operating the facility ahead of time, but if the interest is in investigating a lot of operational issues, you may want to dive into that. And there are some operational issues that have such severe financial impacts that they, that, they come, that they bubble up to a high level in the risk ranking matrix. In general, things that cause minor changes in product quality, uh, things that uh, maybe a compositional change, things that can be readily fixed by the operator without huge financial consequences, and we usually categorize these as operational issues. Those sort of things we typically will just very simply identify this as an operational issue and just move on without going into a lot of safeguards and a lot of other a lot of other issues. Okay, the question was, should anybody be including the review of API standards or other industry standards during the PHA? The answer is usually no. Usually you want people on the team who are very familiar with the standards. They may bring those. They may be good to reference, but they're not necessary to review during the course of the PHA. You're, you really want to make sure that the people who come there, that if you remember from our previous modules, key personnel are engineers, operations staff, and maybe project level personnel. And with reference and access to training and instrumentation and other specialty type areas. For, um, uh, for these, these standards, you want these people to come in knowing all this information. Operations people should be very familiar with the plan operations. Uh, the engineers should be very familiar with the design and really be able to answer questions like what's the design pressure, what's the impact, very easily. Uh, and they should not be having to reference design standards during the course of the HAZOP study. Now, it's nice that they're there that they, and there may be follow-up items to do, but these are things that you normally would just, that would normally just bog down the team. So typically what we do are two things. If there's a homework item where somebody needs to check a standard, if they can't get answered on the spot, it'll be a parking lot item. We talked about parking lot items earlier, or maybe even a follow-up recommendation. The second thing is important to ask the team and challenge them because in the documentation you have to verify that uh, design standards have been met. Now it's not practical to review every element of the design standard, but you want to make sure you challenge the team. Somebody can verify it if they need to. And if you find any deficiencies or suspect any deficiencies, then you want to drill down and really flush that out. Hopefully that answered the question. All right, very good. All right, well, thank you for attending, and thank you for your thoughtful questions, and we'll look forward to you uh, for our next module.